Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Mahesh Senagala, Chair of Architecture, and it is my absolute pleasure to invite you, uh, to welcome you to uh, this very special talk. And it's interesting that uh, we fortunately have a very sunny Earth Day today, and uh, it's very pleasant out there. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, that might be a kind of a misleading uh, uh, kind of experience, uh, given the impending danger uh, that uh, we all face today, uh, the climate change, the prospects of climate change and global warming, and uh, many other uh, kind of issues that are uh, confronting the world today. So in this context, uh, we are... Uh, fortunate to have Professor Gary Coates uh, in our midst to, uh, to talk about a place that uh, many think is uh, a very interesting and successful uh, and an ongoing uh, experiment or practice, if you will, of uh, an ecologically, culturally, and uh, comprehensively sustainable community that uh, works from uh, architectural, all the way up to the urban scales. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Gary Coates. Gary has been a member of uh, uh, faculty at Kansas State University since 1977, and he is currently uh, uh, the inaugural Rainier Distinguished Chair and Professorship at Kansas State University. And uh, he has been for a long time a nationally and internationally recognized voice on the issues of sustainability and uh, cultural uh, and in terms of comprehensive approaches to sustainability that are uh, not just technological but also uh, cultural in, uh, in dimension. Uh, Gary uh, has uh, been an author of uh, many publications including uh, five books and half a dozen book chapters, a dozen book chapters, and some 70 papers uh, published in professional journals. He has edited and authored books uh, including Resettling America, Energy, Ecology, and Community in 1981, uh, Eric Osmussen, Architect in 1997, and The Architecture of Carl Narain in 2007. Without further ado, I would like to uh, give a very warm Ball State, welcome to Gary Coates. Thank you very much, Mahesh. And it's a pleasure to be with you here today on Earth Day. I think that that's just how it happened. I don't th think either Mahesh or I planned it, said, let, let me come and lecture on Earth Day. Uh, but it's, I think, timely and appropriate. Um, what I'd like to show you today, as, as Mahesh has mentioned, is a case study of um, a very special community in Hannover, Germany. It's a North German city. Um, but what I'd like to do is sort of give you first a little bit of background because one's life gets tied up with one's thinking and ideas. And in some sense, we're all children of our time and our age. I see some of my other gray-haired friends who have uh, come out of the first wave of what uh, is now called sustainable design back in the 70s. And um, the events of the 70s had a profound effect on me. I was teaching at the time in the Department of Design and Environmental Analysis at Cornell University. I was involved in uh, various forms are per, of participatory design research and action research, uh, trying to get housing built for migrant farm workers, uh, having my students involved in various design build projects in community contexts, and sort of living out the, the, the sort of ethos that evolved and developed during the late 1960s, and taking that to Cornell and, and providing those kinds of experiences for students. Um, and then, in 1973, there was the Yom Kippur War, Egypt invading the Sinai, 
Um, it's also called the Ramadan War by those in Islamic countries. But it um, was a huge shock that war should break out in that vital region. And the OPEC was just sort of forming and feeling its oats at the time. And Israel was able to withstand the assault of the Egyptian forces because the US kept feeding them new airplanes and all the rest. We became the logistical supply line. And eventually, uh, the Israelis won, if you can say anyone actually ever wins the war. Uh, but they nominally won that war. And OPEC was kind of pissed. And they said, well, we're you're not, not going to sell oil to the United States. And so they withheld supplies from the US and from the world market. And it was the so-called oil embargo against the US. And what it led to, among many other things, was a uh, three, fourfold increase in oil prices from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. Oh, would that we had those days again. Uh, but think about it, within a year, you have a quadrupling of the price of oil. And it led to shortages at the gas stations in this country, long lines, very angry people. And you began to see uh, a cascading effect of what was amounted to only a 2 or 3% reduction in world oil supplies. But it was enough to throw the global economy into a state of what was called stagflation, where you have both recession and increasing prices, because the oil was involved in the production of everything that was made. So prices of oil go up. Everything gets more expensive, even as demand falls. And the economists were scratching their heads and said that this can't happen, because in their world, uh, supply and demand are sort of a magical little circle unconnected to reality. But reality intruded upon that circle. And for me, I began to realize that, um, this is a quote from Edward Goldsmith in a very important book of the time, early 70s, 72, I think, called A Blueprint for Survival. Maybe it was a little later. Uh, that the global, what had become the global industrial way of life altogether was unsustainable. I began to look into these questions, the ways in which architecture and urban design were affected by the free flowing of concentrated cheap fossil fuels, and began to look at the projections of um, petroleum geologists and others in terms of the future supplies of oil and other fossil fuels, and began to realize that we had entered a new age. Post-war prosperity had come to an end at that point, although we had a, a, a brief revival of it uh, based on cannibalizing our own economy. Uh, that's another matter. But uh, we had a period where it was just so absolutely clear that everything had to change. How we designed, how we made cities, how we did agriculture, how we distributed food supplies, how we educated. Uh, and, and it was a a radical shift in worldview for me and many other people at the time. Walter can speak for himself. But, but it certainly was a shock. Um, we, um, and it created what was described at that time as the greatest economic crisis since the 1930s. And indeed it was. Uh, the American century turned out to be just about 25 years. <laughs> it was a short century uh, in terms of our economic and otherwise dominant position in the world. That might be arguable, but that was the feeling of the times. And uh, then in 1979, the Iranian people overthrew the Shah, this sort of brutal dictator that the U US had put in place. And then soon thereafter, Iran and Iraq entered into a long, long war. So they, again, the oil spigots were shutting off. And so at that time, uh, oil went from 12, within a year, uh, about a year, 12 to $30 a barrel. Well, that's a pretty big increase. So within five to six years, we are going a tenfold increase 
And the, the essential commodity that underlay every other processing commodity in the world markets, $3 to $30. We had 10% um, after that uh, second oil crisis, we had 10% per year inflation happening. Uh, for several years into the early 80s. And it led to, in this country and worldwide, massive efforts to conserve energy and to ser search for alternative energies and the rest, which proved actually rather fruitful. And that was the, 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 one of the contributors to the collapse of the elevated oil prices that happened soon after Ronald Reagan came into office. Reagan sort of harvested the the fruits of uh, Carter's policies with regard to conservation and the like. Um, so when I looked at the world through the new lenses of the role of concentrated fossil fuels in everything, it became very clear that it was the routine operation of the economic processes and other processes of industrial society that was necessarily producing what I called in my book uh, that came out in 1981, uh, Resettling America, an ecology of scarcities. That is, not any one scarcity. You looked at every resource, whether it was fossil fuels, um, whether it was mineral resources, uh, whether it was the fabric of life itself, even then, all the world's major biomes and ecosystems were in a, a degraded state of collapse. It was very evident that we had just discovered the environment at the beginning of the 70s and, and research was going on and we're, we're shocked to see the incredible rate at which the fabric of life was being unraveled. And of course, the, the context of all earth process context, global climate was being radically destabilized. Um, and that inevitably, if things, business as usual, continued, that was only going to accelerate. And so in my book, Resettling America, one of the primary premises was that the crisis of sustainability, which was visible, it's interesting, the word sustainability, the initial title of the book was Resettling America Toward a Sustainable Society. And I got a call from my publisher and said, well, we think maybe you might want to change the subtitle of your book. And I said, well, why? I said, well, it's that sustainability thing. It, it's sort of suggesting that our society is not sustainable. And I said, well, have you read the manuscript? <laughs> have you read it? <laughs> anyway, well, so I changed the title. Didn't want to be too, didn't want to frighten people. Uh, now it's become a cliche and watered down so much uh, that it's meaningless. The term is become, becoming almost meaningless. Everything is green. Everything is sustainable. When in fact we still have no clue what it means to create a sustainable society. We have some pointers, principles, but how it's going to play out, what it will look like, is an evolving learning process. Um, and it was also clear that we had entered at that time a period of falling net energy. This is really crucial to understand, that it takes energy to get energy. And when Exxon says, we have to go out in the middle of the ocean and, and, and drill down you know, five miles and, and, and pull up this you know, one year supply of oil out of this little field, and, and that's why we should, should it be allowed to have uh, obscene profits, because it takes so much money and effort. Well, that's another clue that says, net energy is falling from fossil fuels of all sorts. And when you start looking at the net energy of all of the various forms of renewable energy, it is radically less than the heyday of the fossil fuel age. The pattern of settlements, ways of living altogether are defined by the flow through rate of energy through a society, the value of money, everything is in integrated and tied up in that issue. And therefore, I was suggesting that any kind of sustainable society we might make a transition to would require us to resettle America. 
and I was picking up a term from the great uh, humanist and urbanist uh, architectural critic Lewis Mumford. He described the different stages of settling and unsettling and resettling of America that had preceded our time. And, um, bec and, and why would this be important? It's because it, it, the settlements patterns are the, the structure of the system. You can change the flow through rate of elements within a system. You can conserve energy. You can have automobiles that get 70 miles per gallon. And, and you know, if that's the only variable that you're changing, you'll actually deepen the collapse because you'll have more and more uh, greenfield site development further and further away. Your sprawl will increase. And at a certain point, you use up the energy that you save by that conservation measure in one segment of the society, and then you're worse off than you were before. And so my proposition and argument in Resettling America was that uh, we needed to begin a process of restructuring the pattern of settlements to shorten distances, not just to conserve energy, but to reduce distances between places, uh, to begin to link places in more sustainable patterns of transportation and all the rest. And I described, I looked at this notion of the image of the future that we mostly tacitly carry in our minds. What, what's your image of the future? Um, and I described actually a matrix of four quadrants. The two sort of positive, if, if you can think of them that way, positive images of the future that I could name were the super-industrial and the meta-industrial. Essentially, the super-industrial just said, we're going to do more of the same. We're going to dig deeper, go further, recover more fossil fuels, maybe make a few wars, steal somebody's oil, you know, remake the planetary political ecology, uh, and we're going to keep this show going because, as Vice President Cheney said, the American way of life is not negotiable. Um, what I was advocating, uh, using a term taken from the cultural historian William Irwin Thompson was the notion and, and, and the uh, ecologist and cybernetician Gregory Bateson was the notion of a meta-industrial society that we would have to transcend industrial society and create a new kind of next phase. Uh, William McDonough now calls that the third industrial revolution. Uh, based on principles of ecological design, you know, create no waste, run on renewable sources of energy, and enhance and, and propagate biological and human diversity as the principles, you might say, of uh, a meta-industrial society. And Resettling America was trying to present an argument for the necessity of that transition and the centrality of the design of places to that transition and through case studies, trying to show what that might look like if we move down that path. And I was making an argument that it was not the building, the individual building, that was the unit of sustainability. Doing a solar house in the suburbs was fruitless. Not compared to doing an unsustainable house in the suburbs, it's some improvement, but the suburbs would be the problem. You're not solving the problem created by magnifying sprawl and distances between places uh, that, you know, the energy of transportation would have to make up. So um, I said that, that it's almost a, a holographic vision. You know, people are familiar with the notion of a hologram, that if you have a holographic photographic plate and um, you break a piece of it off and you shoot a laser beam through that piece, you still get an image of the whole, call it the whole laser photograph, the whole hologram. Uh, that to create a sustainable society, we'd have to, to deal in units of wholeness. And my metaphor for units of wholeness was the eco-community. Uh, one of the effects of the industrial age was, is, is, has been to create uh, greater separations in geographical distances between people 
essential life functions, but also between and among groups. Think of the uh, proliferation of uh, uh, gated community McMansion settlements, all the houses within a $10,000 uh, uh, difference so that only certain kinds of people with certain kinds of income, certain kind of professions will live together. And, and then you need four cars to live there in order to <laughs> live at all, uh, which requires at least two working adults uh, to keep the fleet fed and operating. Uh, and then the subdivision next door, its own little gated community might be a different price segment. So that, the, that we were magnifying antisocial ways of living, not together, but parallel to each other. So I said that the eco-community would be an instrument of, as well as the expression of, a sustainable society. And further, I defined eco-communities. This could be a neighborhood scale. I said it's also to, possible to think of a building as an ecological community with uh, resource flows and waste flows and loops that could be closed and things that could be integrated. Um, but I said that an eco-community would be characterized by renewable energy production and consumption. Uh, transportation would have to be a part of it. We need to connect ourselves in a inherently more benign and civilized and sustainable ways that uh, climatically adapted passive solar architecture would have to be appropriate to building type, would have to be foundational. Uh, that the life functions, living, working, recreation, education, shopping, worship, needed to be integrated into mixed use patterns. Uh, that we would have to design the human footprint uh, around principles of ecological design, land use, and landscape planning. And that we would have to weave into the fabric of all settlements, eco-communities at various scales, uh, organic, intensive organic agriculture and local food systems because the system that we have now is so absolutely and utterly dependent upon fossil fuels. Half the trucks on the road will be carrying food. Cut those trucks off for three days and the, the shelves are empty in every grocery store in America. It's a, Extraordinary, the amount of, uh, that's required to sustain continental and, and international food system distribution. So these were characteristics that I, that I argued for. Now, of course, si since Resettling America was published in 1981, we entered the last great drunken binge of the fossil fuel age, where Rather than moving in this direction, uh, and again, because of the conservation measures in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, it was possible for the oil price to collapse. Uh, Reagan and Thatcher further encouraged that and got the cooperation of the Shaw or the uh, Saudi prince to uh, keep them down for a while, just long enough to destroy the Soviet Union's economy, uh, which was, of course, rooted in their only export, major export, which was oil and natural gas. Um, and so we entered this period where the super industrial patterning of life and settlements and was magnified. So we moved into the edge city era, the, the, the magnification of sprawl, the SUV era, I call it SAVs, the suburban assault vehicle era. And we uh, you can imagine um, the 80s and 90s were rather painful for me to observe <laughs> and to, uh, because that pattern is exactly what is not sustainable in any kind of believable future. I described it, of course, as the most environmentally intense or energy intensive, environmentally destructive, socially isolating, inherently unsustainable pattern of settlements ever devised. I often challenge my students to come up with a, a more destructive, wasteful uh, way of doing things, and they can hardly do it. You know, three quarters of my students grew up in households with three to four cars because they're coming from suburbs or cities. It's hard to get more, you could, uh, but more or less one car for every human being in your 
your, your nuclear family household. Um, maybe you have another extra one thrown in, et cetera. Uh, so, in recent years, we've begun to see hopeful signs in the U.S. Lead, especially now the emergence of lead uh, neighborhood design, the new urbanism. Different groups begin to say, we've got to live differently. We've got to have more mixed-use, pedestrian-scaled, humanly-scaled settlements. We've got to uh, design buildings where we're conscious of the waste streams and the environmental impacts, upstream and downstream impacts of our materials choices, our energy systems, and all the rest. And these are very hopeful signs. But they're still operating within a framework, a system, which is the creation of the fossil fuel era. We're not yet integrating the new urbanists uh, and I've been a consultant to Andres Diwani on a couple of projects and tried to advocate within that, uh, within that movement. Uh, but again, for example, Diwani's clients tend to be developers, and uh, they, they, they have nothing to say about integration of energy systems. And yes, it'd be nice to have transportation connections, but that's another department. <laughs> you know, it's another silo in and the bureaucracies, local and national bureaucracies for project development. And, and, and LEAD, again, is, is doing a lot of good things, wonderful movement, had a very benign effect, but still falling short of restructuring the system. It's still working within the system to optimize behaviors within a certain kind of system, way of development, a way of doing business, et cetera. And so, ironically for me, that the ideas, most of which originated in the United States in the very creative period of the 70s and early 80s, uh, other countries, Denmark and Sweden I'm very familiar with, have done a, a, two books on Swedish architects, and much of their work is involved in what we would call sustainable design. And, um, but it's Germany that has become the world leader in the movement to create a sustainable society. You know, their parliament building, the Reichstag, is soon to be 100% powered by renewable energy with uh, combined heat and power systems. Uh, imagine that, that we were running uh, the White House and Capitol Hill with totally sustainable energy systems. Hmm. Um, they have, as a national goal, to make the conversion to 100% renewable energy in the nation by mid-century, by 2050, with interim deadlines for the penetration of renewable energy into the mix of fuels. Um, they already have fabulous uh, intra-city trams and trains and intercity systems that can easily convert to being supplied sustainably in the rest. And so it is a national commitment and policies have been designed to make that happen. That's one of the things that's missing in our country right now. We've not had any federal leadership, rather the opposite, um, in the last, um, not only the last eight years, that's especially bad, but, but really since uh, 1982. Uh, we've had a total failure of vision and leadership in this country on this issue. Um, so I won't get into the various uh, carbon taxes and energy buyback and feed-in laws that Germany has instituted, but they have been able to move from virtually, in 10 years, virtually having no installed wind capacity, PVs and all the rest, um, to being the world leader in all of these areas. And that's manifested itself in projects that I will then focus on the Kronzberg Urban District, which is a part of the city of Hannover, North Germany. And it's the largest, most comprehensive, most well integrated, both in terms of the participatory design process, the partnerships between public and private sectors, and the actual physical design of the settlement itself. It is, to me, uh, almost the purest example of an eco-community, as I had envisioned it and called for in Resettling America. Uh, most of you probably know William McDonough when I mentioned his name. 
cradle to cradle. And McDonough wrote the Hanover Principles um, for the city. And this district was developed as a demonstration project for Expo 2000, which was the, the theme was sustainability, um, to be hosted at the Mesa, which is very near the site. We'll see it in a moment. Uh, the, the big, huge fairgrounds that Hanover has uh, as a model sustainable urban district for, planned for 15,000 people. Just give you a very quick timeline to get a, a time frame around this, that, that uh, in 1983, this local area at the edge of the city of Hanover was evaluated. It was sort of the city owned most of the land, and it was about the last big tract of land that could be developed to accommodate population growth. And so they asked the question, well, could, could we develop here? The first hydrological studies in 83 showed that if you develop by the conventional parameters of development of the time, you would destroy the hydrological balance of the region, the adjoining small village and the agricultural lands, et cetera. Uh, you wouldn't be recharging the aquifers. You would create flood issues. Uh, and you, you know, it was sort of off the table at that point. You say, God, this would, we can't do this. <laughs> but as the, um, actually this should be 1992, as the Expo planning uh, began to emerge in Expo 2000, so they were looking forward to that. They knew they would host it. They said, well, let's look at this again. And they did an environmental impact assessment and came up more, much more detail and came up with the same kind of conclusions that conventional development was not, uh, was only destructive to the naturally occurring ecosystems. Uh, so the Germans at that point said, well, we can't do conventional development. Then. What do we have to do so that we, we, if we develop this district, this area, which was farmland and pasture land, woodland at the time, uh, it would be, as if nothing had ever been developed there in terms of what the hydrologic, how the hydrological systems and, and ecosystems of that area would be functioning. So they said that just becomes a design parameter. That's the task. They held then an international competition within the framework of these kinds of general guidelines. And a firm out of uh, Switzerland won the competition. And what that called for was a um, sort of a, a dense, compact settlement that would leave as much as possible, uh, not, you can't call it wilderness, but a natural preserve area. Um, and would mean that um, you could have the economies of scale that come from building more densely. Uh, within the framework of that winning competition entry, they had another competition the very next year, which was to really develop in more detail what this urban district itself would look at. The, first, again, should be 1992 competition, looked at a, a sort of a micro-regional area. Um, then in 1994, they got a, a five ar uh, landscape architecture firms together to really get into this question, well, how do we invent a way in which we can build at 47 units per acre, which is the eventual density. We consider that to be high density. Uh, settlement in that would not have a detrimental effect on the local hydrological systems and ecosystems. The Keenast group, uh, planning group, won that invited competition. And they had, therefore, at that point, a framework in mind. And they began construction in 1998. Their notion was that the, the huge number of workers that would be brought in to develop the exposition sites would be housed in phase one of Kronzberg. Uh, and um, and so it began. So um, by 2003, there actually the, the dates have gotten scrambled here. By 2000, they had some housing built for 3,000 workers, and uh, the 2013. Where did that come from? It's possessed these. Machines are possessed. 2009, today, there are 3,300 units completed uh, with some 6,600 residents. 
And here is a kind of uh, checklist or profile of what we'll be looking at as we look at the drawings and images of this community. That we have, first of all, a compact urban fabric, clearly defined uh, uh, blocks, uh, block structure, a gridded uh, city with block structure, clearly defined edge between the urban development and the nature preserve. It would have diverse public amenities, uh, schools, daycare centers, a teen center, shops, restaurants, all the elements of everyday life. Uh, they would take care of the transportation connection, so they extended a tram out. Uh, you can get into the center of Hanover in about 18 minutes, and that runs every eight to 10 minutes, so it's good connections. There are bus connections, automobile connections. Integration of living and working, the Mesa itself employs a huge, that's the convention center district, uh, uh, employs a lot of people. And there was an information park, IBM and that sort of jobs. Um, walking distance from this district uh, with some 3,000 jobs. Uh, they realized you'd have to integrate energy planning and development and in this community. So they're using uh, decentralized uh, combined heat and power systems. That's where you, people are familiar with that, that technology. You, you produce heat um, and sort of like think of a car engine that, that uh, you cool it by the um, radiator. Uh, well, that heat, instead of being wasted, like if you have a large, say, coal burning plant, that heat is wasted. That heat generates in a conventional plant steam. The steam turns the turbine. That makes the electricity. And about two to three units of uh, uh, the primary energy is thrown away as in part potentially environmentally destructive heat before you can release the, the cooling water back into the environment. And combined heat and power systems, which you can decentralize, um, you can do at a building scale or a neighborhood or a district scale or larger. Uh, that waste heat, so to speak, becomes the uh, uh, heating system for all the buildings. Um, so you can have tremendous efficiencies up to 90% and above in terms of primary fuel use. So they made that decision. That would be integral to the urban design. Uh, water, waste, soils management policies, uh, open spaces, both for recreation and for study. And the city itself conceived as the integration of nature and culture in the, in the urban environment, rather than just city and then nature, but the idea of the intertwining. Um, in a very visionary move, that they planned and built an organic urban farm adjoining the district and an education center to teach others how to do organic farming. Ran that farm off of um, biogas and PV systems. And then, of course, this, this preserved area where they wanted to cultivate and reestablish and develop a variety of uh, ecosystems with the notion of enhancing biodiversity. And that's one of the great crises of our time, of course, is the biodiversity crisis, the species extinction crisis, et cetera. So all of that was in their vision. We'll now go through and take a look at these dimensions. Um, this is the, the district, the urban district first two neighborhoods have been built. The planning area included a much larger area in terms of hydrological impacts and the rest. Um, the Mesa, this, this fairground is, is here. The information park is here. This is a primary school was developed here. gives you a little better snapshot of the relationship of all these different parts. You see how large this uh, convention center is. I think it's probably the largest in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. In terms of land use, um, they wanted to have a mix of uses again, this notion that, that if you shorten distances between things and make it walkable, that you don't have to use the car. You know, the best way to have a really um, sustainable uh, personal transport system is not to have to use cars very much. The best way for a designer to solve a problem is not to create the problem. 
always going to be the most cost-effective action. And so again, it's very conventional, traditional urbanistic ideas that they're proposing.
this is open all the way, but it's sort of visually terminated by buildings here. Well, there will be paths that will allow you to make your way this way, so it's a more rambling kind of path going parallel to the contours than it is going perpendicular to the contours. Uh, but when you're in, I'll have some images shortly where you can see this effect. I want to explain this landscape urbanism concept that um, what they have is, is bioswales or the um, uh, soakway system, the molden Rigolin system here, where runoff from the pavement uh, from the sidewalks finds its way into this, and again, it soaks through uh, soil, uh, sand, uh, French drain type rocks with the, the pipe for, uh, to, to run uh, again to bleed off um, some of that if it's not able to soak in quickly enough. So they have carefully engineered this network of trenchways along all of the streets. But how they handled that question within each block, we'll see that is a landscape design issue. And their notion was they not only wanted to deal with the problems that can be created by stormwater management or lack of management, but they wanted to make water visible. They wanted to make an artistic and expressive element in the landscape, whether it was raining or not raining, one would feel somehow the celebration of the presence of this life-giving, sensuous element. Again, just looking at, here's under construction uh, at a, in terms of, you get, again, you can see the way in which water feeds in and then it will, it will flow, in this case, going downhill that direction. Uh, and the way in which it looks uh, when projects are developed. It's almost un-German. It's not totally tidy. Looks kind of weedy um, to a German. You know, I've seen Germans standing out in the rain washing their windows in their houses. Uh, meticulous, crisp surfaces and edges, so, but people have adapted to it. They kind of know what's going on and why, and a new kind of aesthetic is emerging. The two medians of the boulevards, uh, one in the north neighborhood, one in the south, and the middle neighborhood, uh, were designed by the, the great landscape designer water designer Herbert Dreisaitl. Some of you may know his name. But these are particularly rich celebrations. They become kind of linear parks, celebrations of the presence of water, and places to, to explore. Um, these can be operated, um, little dams, little check dams, and children can play with that in the rain, and their mothers allow it. Even if they don't, they can do it, <laughs> and they will do it. Um, and again, the landscape elements have been in place for about 10 years in these images. They celebrated the 10th year of occupation in 2008, the first workers that moved into the first phase of construction. So again, these become uh, places for casual neighboring, for watching life go by, for kids to explore and play hide and seek, play with water etc. And again, these connect the natural preserve to the densest urban edge of the community. So you, you really feel these fingers of green, which was part of the Kenast plan from the landscape workshop, that concept. A lot of attention to species diversity in, in the plantings and the like. And just sort of different images of The uh, urban blocks have the notion that there still is a public outer edge, a face that faces the street, which is more public. The interiors of blocks are uh, more private, even though they're still open to anyone who wants to walk through the pathway system that links the interiors of blocks, but still more private. And in many cases, residents have actually worked with the developer design teams to figure out what should be put into their, what they want put into their blocks. If they're child, family-dominated, resident, largely, you'll see more playgrounds, more 
adult uh, residents, they'll have uh, spaces uh, that are more uh, suitable for adult gatherings. Um, some cases, little cafes have sprung up. Each courtyard was required to have its own community space for a meeting space, a room to, to meet. So there's a widely dispersed set of places where people can gather. And so it's a constant surprise if you wander through this uh, district what you're going to find. It's interesting to me that children proposed to the, the community center, made a proposal to the community center. They said they wanted to make a map for new kids moving to the area about where all the neat playthings were, where the places where you could buy ice cream would be. Uh, and so they did their own research and uh, got a grant, <laughs> and they produced these maps uh, so that kids can be oriented to this, this vast field of opportunities for interaction with other kids and for play. And that's, I think, one reason why we find very little vandalism, because there are people from the community center walking the streets constantly, saying, well, how are things going? What's up? Got any problems? And where groups can come together and make proposals. What we need is a ballet class. So, well, let's look into that. Let's see how many other people would be interested in a ballet class, enough people. They form a ballet class. They meet at the community center or one of the other community rooms in the neighborhoods. This block in particular had the theme, had a developer who was very passionate about uh, integrating different races, religions, and ethnicities. Uh, Germany is kind of going through a, a, an Americanization process. A lot of uh, a growing Muslim population, but also people who are by blood German, but they're coming maybe from Russia or this, that, and the other. Uh, this block was intended to celebrate this kind of difference. And there is a restaurant that sort of grew out of the residents saying, yeah, let's, let's make a restaurant where you can get some Muslim food. Floor plans were laid out in particular in this area to support extended families and Muslim preferences for housing space, et cetera. Um, so there's a very conscious attempt to make social diversity integral. Again, this, this view shows from the interior of this block, looking through hill sloping up this way, looking through, and the space is sort of closed here. If we stood here and looked the other direction, we would see nothing but green going all the way to the Kronzberg Hill. I think I may have an image of that coming up shortly. And so it's a constantly evolving landscape. I go from year to year to, to study this and look at it and to talk to uh, people there. And uh, well, play sets been added here and sandbox area here and this, that, and the other. So it, it's very amenable to user-driven requests for change and for environmental uh, alterations that serve the needs of the different groups. Of course, I guess in America, out of fear of litigation, we would, we would have uh, barbed wire fences and, and uh, police guards, uh, loudspeakers saying, don't go further, you're near the water's edge. I don't know. Germans uh, don't fall in such places and drown. I, it's just a different kind of people. With Americans, we see water, we immediately are going to fall in. I don't know what the reason is. I can understand though people look at this and say, well, we couldn't do that in this country. Well, maybe we should challenge that. And again, these sort of dry rivers, uh, which there are rain events frequently, where this becomes a running stream and a soak away system. So again, the, the variability, the connection to the rhythms and cycles of nature was a big part of their idea. Yes. A high density settlement. No, it's not cut off from nature. Of course, that's the great American dream, the middle landscape. This is one of these views where, where you look all the way up and you don't realize it's a, a, an urban grid. You just see greenery going from the tram line all the way up to the Kronzberg Hill. 
And again, I have sort of by choice minimized pictures which have lots of people in, in it so that I didn't get into a lot of privacy issues. I could probably be sued by that girl if she ever saw this picture shown in a place like this. But um, When I've been there, the place has been swarming with kids. But again, just different ways in which this stormwater management system has expressed itself. The energy concept, they had goals for this total settlement to reduce carbon emissions by 60% compared to the already very high performing German building energy system standards. Uh, normative German standards would be, well, well, we still need to work to get close to the normative standards. So this would be 60% less. Um, and they're doing it by a variety of means. First, I've mentioned that the uh, two decentralized combined heat and power systems uh, by uh, significant amounts of, of insulation and some projects super insulation and the wind-powered electricity. And they did a study over a three-year period and found that they didn't quite get to 80% when you include the wind power, but they got to 74% reduction in CO2 emissions. There are great long reports for anyone interested in the technical evaluative methods, which are, I can just say, very German. Thorough precise, transparent, et cetera. And they just love their equipment and machinery. Uh, but here again, you see the district heating system. Residents are required to buy from these systems. It's not voluntary in, in terms of making a go of it economically. That's the larger little building for a CHP unit. The other one is in the basement of one of the blocks of housing on the north neighborhood. And then in this nature preserve, the presence of wind generators. And, and they contribute to a 28% of that 74 reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. So they're approach, approaching the ideal that you should produce as much as or more than the energy for the eco-community. So you add the, the module, you add the unit of energy production if you find a proper scale and environmental circumstances. Germany is greatly encouraging R&D and, and uh, uh, commercialization project, projects in the area of biogas, uh, as well as, as wind electric systems and PVs. Some exciting breakthroughs happening in those fields. And, you know, this is not a huge system, but on the community center, on the roof, they have a, a PV array, and you can, of course, for educational purposes, go and see live time, how much energy is being generated by the array, uh, the array on different days, and it increases awareness. The same thing for the primary school, uh, which uh, also has that same kind of display. So it's, a, again, part of an ongoing educational process and the organization that with the communications group for this project continued after uh, occupancy to be a communications group, helping citizens to fine tune their buildings. Uh, they did the, the study about energy use and said, yeah, we're falling a little short here on appliance uh, electrical demand. Uh, we, we thought, you know, um, here's how you could reduce your energy uses and so they continue the, the process of the communications group that was instrumental to the whole design, planning, development process. They're still there doing this work. I think that's very important. They established, sort of off the shelf, this is not super insulation, but a Kronzberg low energy house standard. Every developer architect team had to show that they would meet this. And then they come back and do blower door tests and the rest. And let me tell you, if they didn't achieve what they said they were going to achieve, there are penalties to be paid by the developer. So they get real focused on getting this right. 
This is the farm. Fabulous idea, integral to my conception of ego communities. This is sadly a farm that economically did not survive. It went for a few years, uh, but they found that it was not close enough, and I don't know why they couldn't market their goods, or really what went on. I've, I've been trying to probe this, but uh, they did not have enough market sale of their produce, their, their uh, sausages, their meats. You know, it was a full service kind of German mixed use farm. Um, and so economically, that did not, in this instance, prove to be viable. And now it's used as a conference center for other groups and purposes, more scaled back in terms of the agriculture. So there's a very delicate ecology to make businesses viable in mom and pop shops and, and uh, locally grown uh, food and the like. And then I'll end with three projects. Within the scope of the whole development, they had special grants available for anyone who wanted to apply for them where, where there would be more experimental architecture. Um, and they get a little subsidy from the European Union, a little bit from the city, uh, to sort of take some risk and push the envelope in terms of energy efficiency and passive solar design. This is a project in the Kronzberg Middle neighborhood called Solar City. And the notion here, uh, again, the latitude of Hanover is very far north. Uh, very long, tend to be more sunny days in the summer. And the notion is, couldn't you bottle some of the summer <laughs> and carry it over into the winter? So it's using a seasonal heat storage. It's a solar thermal system with its own local district heating distribution system. Uh, and a large thermal storage tank, which becomes a part of the playground we'll see in a moment. Uh, and then, so they use what they can generate on site to maximum potential, and then they tap in to the CHP process heat and, uh, well, of course, they're already into the electrical system. Uh, so they wanted to see how the thermal, uh, solar thermal storage of summertime heat would work. Big earth integrated tank. Swedes have looked into this at great length as well. This, this approach when you have these very strong, uh, strongly seasonal Nordic climates. You can see again the way in which the thermal hot water collectors are integrated in the project. And this is the tank. It becomes a, a mountain, half of it's underground, half is above, insulated, and it becomes a, a major uh, centerpiece of a thematic playground. One of the more popular ones among the children, I understand. And you see a stream of kids coming from different neighborhoods over here with their parents, most if they're young. If they're not so young, they come alone. This was the idea of perhaps having a, a microclimate zone, an atrium, which could um, serve as, well, a place where you could get out and play during the winter uh, in terms of a semi-protected environment somewhere between the interior uh, and the exterior climates, uh, and which would function as, um, you can see here in the diagrams, the summer uh, mode, the sheets of plasticized glazing can, they have a printed pattern on them so that if you sort of clam them up, it's as if the puzzle gets closed and that blocks the sun. If you open them up, there are enough pathways that you can have direct sun coming through. So that was the notion of the operation of the atria, which in this case run uh, north-south, which is an issue in such a northern climate. Um, but again, their notion was it would be either a stack ventilation, uh, draft induction cooling system, uh, or a heat sink in the winter so that they could have um, a less of a delta T between the atrium and the adjoining interior spaces, and you could sit out on your balconies, and, and, uh, and the rate of heat loss would be less. So that was this notion in this block. 
This didn't prove to be as successful as they had hoped, actually, and probably those of you who know something about bioclimatic design could probably guess some of the reasons why. Nevertheless, you're doing it for many reasons. It's a play space. It's a place where you can set your plants out. So from the human usability, not necessarily from the energy point of view solely, from a human usability point of view, it's still quite popular. Again, as it has grown in a bit. Now, this, this block is, uh, was bought up by Americans. So we don't get a good rap here. And their notion was, we're going to make it a gated community. So they fenced off the commons. <sighs> Anyone you talk to in Kronzberg <laughs> knows this block. Mm -hmm. We're making no friends here. Um, anyway, last project, just a couple of slides. Uh, there was an attempt to build super insulated passive solar houses that would use so little energy that, in effect, they wouldn't even need central heating systems. And, and what they would tap off of in terms of the district heating would be virtually nil. And um, these may be less successful architecturally, by my judgment, but in terms of livability and energy performance, really did perform. And they, they had detailed studies of this area, again, uh, green roofs, uh, they even added here solar thermal uh, on, on site. This is actually should be a two story, because they're all two stories. But you get passive solar, uh, they didn't slip any little windmills in, uh, but, uh, and they of course have air to air heat exchangers so that you get fresh air by taking the warm inter air, blowing it past the stream of incoming fresh air so you don't lose heat, but you have good interior environment conditions. Uh, and it's turned out now that they have adopted the passive house building performance standards for all new construction in the city of Hanover and for all retrofit. And they're doing some very serious solar retrofit up to these standards. Because that what they've shown is if you get demand down this low, you can actually run a contemporary society in terms of the housing building stock on renewable energy. And that's the only way you get there. So this is suddenly, again, a spin-off of the Kronzberg experiment has been the adoption of these standards. And, and I suspect there are probably going to be similar performance standards for different microclimates of Germany as they move towards their national goal of 100% renewable energy powered society by mid-century. That's it. I'd be glad to take any questions you have. I know things have run on a, a little long here. Uh, but I'm happy to answer whatever questions might be on your mind. Yes. Studies have indicated any aspects that would maybe be done that were unsuccessful that would be done totally different the next time in uh, a similar community? Well, the two areas that pop out are the fact that they had really had uh, a desire to drive down the use of electricity for appliances in the units. And the way they did that was to offer information, uh, uh, fee baits, kickbacks, if you bought the Energy Star appliances, uh, and if you learned how to operate your system so that you were intelligent, like don't leave your windows open in the winter, that kind of stuff. But in the appliance area and electricity use, they had been shooting, you know, they were like one-fifth of what they had hoped to achieve. And it was because users didn't initially, in the first three-year period of evaluation, didn't buy into it. And even though they had a commissioning process and an educational process and even incentives to buy equipment, et cetera, people didn't buy into that in the initial phase. And, and so since they have the same communications group that was involved in the planning, design, or initial commissioning, that, that group is continuing, then they're going back and saying, look at the results we found. 
your neighbor has these appliances and the energy use there for electricity is 28% less than yours, you might still consider going the way of your neighbor and that sort of thing. So they're still working that communications process. But again, as we found in many studies in this country, user variability can, can pr produce more differences between virtually identical units than just physical design can do. So the human component is absolutely crucial. That's one area. Um, and then I've mentioned the fact that they haven't seemed to have achieved the kind of critical mass necessary to have a lot of small viable businesses, the kind of density of retail and commercial outlets that they have achieved. And maybe if they develop a whole district of 15,000 people, you would, you know, what that threshold is, we don't know, but that's been a disappointment. Um, those are the things that come to me most immediately that, that have popped up. Good question. Uh, I don't know, is it on? Okay. <clears throat> I've been there about three times in the last eight years. Yeah, yeah. So I've been uh, sort of looking at it. And what I discovered is that it, I don't know whether it's really a city. I, because um, I, it, it was empty most of the time that I was there, except for the children. Mm -hmm. The children played all over the mm -hmm. place. But I found l very little bicycles flying around. But, I, but the thing that, that, that uh, I thought was very interesting is there are, I couldn't find any places that were that was really theirs, like little like the garden children. areas. You mean the the, uh, the residents? Exactly, exactly. That everything was so designed. One part was where you might be parking. The other part became their little decks. I didn't see any garden areas or vegetable areas or something that you can really take ownership that you would have in in in, in a community. That's a good observation. Um, their notion is that there are private domains, but they're very tiny. Even if you have a ground floor apartment, you don't get too much more than a patio in terms of that, in terms of the private zone, and the ratio of public to private is, is such. Um, my friends uh, actually designed the two schools, the architects there, and they're very critical of Kronzberg because, well, it's neither here nor there. It's not really, it doesn't have the vitality and, and density and yeastiness of a city, and it's more dense than a suburb, and, uh, and that's been a primary criticism there. They also believe that the housing should have been developed as infill lots inside the fabric of the city, except as they were looking at demand at the time they decided to go ahead, it couldn't have handled the uh, amount of housing demand they thought they had. So they went with this, but that is an enduring criticism. None of my architecture and urban planning friends in Germany are happy with the foundation decision. Uh, how, how much should you shrink the blocks to get a little more density? How much should you increase the privatized zone of space to get a little more sense of inhabitation and ownership? Um, these are important questions. I, I think it's really at the threshold between urban and suburban. It's a high-density suburban environment. Uh, has, it, I, I could characterize it that way, um, and it's a good it's a good observation, because we're trying to find what that the precise spatial ecology is to achieve the intentions. Uh, the inhabitations, by the way, is designed for market-rate housing that collapsed, and most of the people who live here are immigrants, Germans from the Ukraine or the Volga Germans, so-called, and from other places uh, that have rights of citizenship because bloodlines can be established. But, and they, and they're high, they tend to be highly educated uh, people, uh, and they're having difficulty um, finding employment within the German economy for lots of different reasons. Uh, they up the amount of the threshold for social housing income threshold. They doubled it so that they could have higher income than just the lowest part of the, so, of the social strata. And there are more kids per capita and per unit land area in this settlement than anywhere else in uh, Lower Saxony, certainly. You know, it's very family and, and kid intensive. Why, I, I also share your observation that I didn't see so many adults swarming kids, uh, some bike riding coming and going, but um, you know, this is a puzzle I hope to learn more about, uh, you know, in terms of 
of that same observation. Because at the same time, I was looking at Dutch communities mm -hmm. and how the Dutch are handling this. And I thought the Dutch were a bit more successful. Now, perhaps I'm biased a little bit, but uh, I, I, but I agree with you. I, 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 uh, I didn't see the, the shops were not as vibrant as you find, found in Hanover. Like I worked in Hanover for several years. Yeah. So I still feel I, they still felt like that. I still felt that the Germans were not accepting this environment as much as the immigrants who were actually pushed yeah. into it. And they're very happy with that in terms of yeah. options available to them. Right. Which is, I think one reason why there's no graffiti and you know there there is a sense of ownership there altogether. But it it, it hasn't achieved the urban district parameter fully. The actual symptoms are beautiful. Yeah. 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 Professor Coase, thank you for a wonderful uh, lecture. My question is related more to the financing uh, sort of scheme because I've worked on several projects here in the U.S. and it's really difficult to finance public realm kind of development, especially, you know, like for example, the tank that you showed and what was the financial structure and how much public money in terms of uh, the investment took place to to get that urban structure which has seemed to be very very rich as i understand it the most of the land except for a piece that was owned by grunlock developer was owned by the city of hanover and they financed the public sector infrastructure by land sales to private developers now the private developer who put in the, the seasonal storage tank they must have folded that into the unit price of, of their block development, as best I can figure. It wasn't, it wasn't part of the public infrastructure. It was within the blocks. Uh, the performance requirements as conditions of land sale said you have to meet these conditions in terms of tying in with the total groundwater or stormwater management system, uh, in terms of densities, in terms of setbacks and footprints and ratios of, of building to land area. And all of that was very precisely prescribed. Uh, and then the individual developers said, yeah, I can play by these rules and, and rent these units under that framework. So it was, a, it was a kind of partnership, but if the city hadn't owned the land, then it's, a, then it's America. <laughs> what do you think we can uh, learn that is applicable in the Midwest? That's a question that I often come back to. <laughs> um, I think that we need to begin looking for distinctively American in terms of densities and in terms of, let's say, housing building types and the like. We need to come back to a language that, that is situated in our culture. Uh, and, and Americans you know, tend not to like cities. <laughs> Um, and we tend to have this, this greenfield suburban ideal to a certain extent. Uh, so I think we need to have the same intention in terms of integrating uh, nature into the developments, even if their densities are increased, even if they're compact, even if they're walkable and all of that sort of thing. Um, I think there are economies of scale if we can begin to have um, the integration of district heating and the like energy systems appropriate to the climate. I know that's problematic where you have severely humid and hot summers with the winters, so you couldn't use the same kinds of technologies. But we need to look for ways by which we can, can integrate uh, these systems, perhaps more photovoltaics. You know, as discussions going on now about smart grids that, that maybe you would have uh, PV systems integrated into the house and that would charge your plug-in hybrid or a plug an electric vehicle. And, um, and that would be part of a, a, a smart grid and this, that, and the other. There's this, this project, the Wild Sage co-housing project in Boulder. You may be familiar with that as part of a, a larger development. But it was, again, the users were involved as the core in terms of the Wild Sage co-housing. Uh, and then the rest was sort of developed for sale. But that looked interesting to me. They did some good things in terms of tying into some mass transit. Uh, it was a place-making kind of thing. 
Uh, they have a small district heating system integrated into at least a portion of that, as I understand the literature on the web. Uh, that began to look like something that would be between the, the spec-built rental, moderate density rental housing and the private single family house in the suburbs. That, that there's a, a kind of middle ground to be discovered that will be distinctive to, to regions and to the American culture. Uh, I don't think Americans would settle for this. That's not, I think most Americans look at that and say, yeah, that's how they live, maybe. It's not what I'd want, uh, probably. I, you can tell me. But I suspect in many cases that would be. And I don't think they've nailed it at Kronzberg in terms of this balance between the urban and the rural or suburban either. Um, I'd like to have a redesign. <laughs> and build another one and see what we get there and build it out to 15 instead of 6,000 people and see if that provides enough webbed interconnection to, to support these small businesses better. If the income of the residents was not at the lower end of the spectrum, I suspect you'd have more successful retail outlets. So I think what turned out to be a, a stratification, flat stratification towards the lower end of the income spectrum, greatly impacted the uh, viability of, of this you know, traditional German city pattern of, of small shops and businesses. Um, no project that I know in this country in, in terms of uh, the new urbanism has figured that out, how to get viable mix of uh, retail and commercial uses either. Um, but in terms of the paradigm, the vision and, and the, the holographic image of wholeness, I think it's, uh, it has all the pieces. They would just, in this country, be put together in other and different ways. Different probably in Boulder than they would be in Muncie for climatic and cultural reasons. So I think, again, it becomes you're guided by a certain kind of vision, certain kinds of principles of sustainability and you say, well then how would we fabricate and put that together here and now? What would work? Uh, I, I agree that we need to look at some new typologies perhaps here and uh, more for higher densities. But I, I'm curious to compare the dead density in that particular example with what uh, the density of uh, say downtown Mansi would have been when it was inhabited uh, with all the private gardens, the backyards, and so on, and uh, you could imagine to transform a model like that into something more uh, ecologically sustainable with uh, bias wells and, and sounds like a great studio so project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it, that's exactly the question. I mean, I don't have the answers right off the bat, but it's the right question. Um, yeah, 47 units per acre is pretty dense for Americans. And, um, you know, I look at Kronzberg and I think, you know, one nice thing about perhaps having too much green in the interior blocks is you've got great opportunities for productive organic agriculture. As times get tougher, I can see orchards happening. I can see more intensive uh, uh, organic gardening and farming activities, and I can see that really getting much more dense in terms of those kinds of aspects of land use in the future as, as uh, the, the, the multiple crises of sustainability confront us. Great. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps is a natural point to call it a day. And uh, thank you very much, Gary, yep. for uh, the talk and, uh, and the discussion as well. We will continue talking about that. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>